On the temple walls of ancient Egypt, this phrase was displayed predominantly, and it made quite an impression on the Greeks who adopted it. It read, Know Thyself. In 2750 BC, a young gifted boy was born to a well-to-do family in Kemet. Quickly, through his extraordinary intellect displayed throughout his education, the boy broke the mold and was allowed to learn from multiple guilds, each of which he absorbed at an amazing pace. Eventually, he would be included in the School of Initiates, a secret school reserved for those who hold the keys to all restricted knowledge in Egypt. It is there, after having acquired initiate-level knowledge from virtually all the sciences known to man at the time, that the pharaoh himself took notice of the young man. Pharaoh Djoser, one of the most successful pharaohs in Kemet, would ask his new advisor to build him an impossible monument, one that could stand the test of time, a veritable ship that would house him for eternity on his journey to the afterlife. For any mere mortal, these tasks would not be feasible. But this was no ordinary man. This was none other than Imhotep, the African boy who invented medicine and who built the greatest monuments in history in his spare time. What was his secret? What technique did he pioneer that were so consequential that they lasted through countless civilizations? How did he build the pyramids in such exact precision and such that they lasted four and a half thousand years? Today, we will go over how Imhotep built the pyramid, and we will see why it remained a mystery hidden in plain sights for 4,000 years. The Great Pyramid has more than 2 million stones. That's three quarters of the way to the moon if you line all of those stones up. It's perfectly aligned to the stars and to our magnetic pole. But arguably its most impressive property are its size, durability, stone placement precision, and the elusive construction methods used to achieve the above. The construction method was never an enigma, and here is why. We have written evidence, experimental evidence, geological evidence, archaeological evidence, architectural evidence, and chemical evidence, and we will review all of them today. Have you hit that like button yet? What will it take to change your mind? Do you want me to show you a picture of a beautiful lady or handsome man before you do? Well, here she is. Isn't she exquisite? She has it all, slender body, long neck, and that walk. Make sure you share this video with all your friends and loved ones before the trolls come in here. You've all heard them before, those elaborate theories of the construction of the pyramids, some more outlandish and others simply outworldly. But if one must bring forth a theory, then that theory must satisfy all conditions, properties, and evidence that we have. This is important because those who support a theory will defend it even when it clearly doesn't fit. Often, the defenders of these theories have financial motives to do so. Other times, it is just resistance to change or unwillingness to admit the truth. So before we get too far, let's first list out the constraints and evidence that all theories must adhere to. Since there is a large body of them, we will break them down into larger categories. Number one, it has to be logical. Number two, it should not require a leap of faith. Number three, it has to be economically sensible. Number four, the process has to allow for human error while concluding in a product of extreme precision. Number five, it has to be contemporaneous with the reign of the kings of the Giza Plateau. Number six, it has to fit the evidence on the ground. Number seven, Above all, it has to be reproducible with the elements at Kemet's disposal. All the theories presented so far fail at one or more of the properties above. Take the theory that the pyramid stones were queried and chiseled with copper tools. This method does not fit the evidence. It fails the logic, economic, and evidence test. The Giza stones do not look quarried and chiseled. You don't find markings of mistake, especially in the millimeter-precise fittings of the stones, one against each other. Even if this technique may have been used later and for other projects, it clearly wasn't used in Giza. Others advance the theory of the ramp. When you are building the most expensive project in history, what you don't want is the preparation for that project to be far more expensive than the project itself. 
Also, there is no physical evidence for a ramp, and there is no written evidence for a ramp. Lastly, you also have to dismantle the ramp once done, which would be exorbitantly costly too. The ramp fails at almost all levels of our test. In some version, the ramp would have to change its inclination as the pyramid rises. This is yet another gargantuan project, making it economically unsound. Lastly, this method also implies that the stone blocks were cut with copper tools, which as we saw does not fit the mold. Well then, it must have been the Herodotus machine. Here, we want to be clear and separate what Herodotus witnessed firsthand and what he was relayed. When Herodotus says that the Egyptians had black skin and woolly hair, well, that is from first witness account. But when he describes the Herodotus machine, he is describing a machine that he saw or was related to him, but it would have been a machine contemporary to his time, and not a machine that would have existed 2,000 years before Herodotus was born. Kemet, between 2600 BC and 450 BC, went through considerable changes and evolution. Later temples in Egypt do show clear signs of cut stones, but not Giza. What about the aliens, then? Although it would be easy to dismiss this to ridicule, we should not. What we have to do is examine the theory for its merit. Unfortunately, there are no indications whatsoever that extraterrestrials were in Kemet at this point in time. There are indications that godlike, powerful, and all-knowing beings were present in Kemet's very ancient past, at the time of, quote, Atlantis, end quote, but none during the time of the Third Dynasty. There is also no archaeological evidence that supports this theory. What then would have been the method utilized by the Kemetu? In 1991, Prof. Davidovitz, an expert in geopolymer, advanced the hypothesis that the Egyptians would have used a composite material to create their block, very much so like we use concrete today, and this method would have resulted in the block types that we see in Giza today. To prove his theory, he showed that the block stones in Giza had the same physical, chemical, structural, and geological properties as the synthetic blocks he created using material in situ. And to the naked eye, they were indistinguishable from the natural limestone. This is remarkable because it would indicate that the blocks from the pyramids in Giza were molded in place, a process that would have been orders of magnitude easier to execute. Here are the telltale signs that support this theory, as quoted from his articles. This photo shows a sample of the casing from the ascending passage of Cheops' Great Pyramid, given by the French Egyptologist Jean-Philippe Lore in 1982 to J. Davidovitz. Now, the cross-section is characterized by the presence of organic fibers and air bubbles that do not exist in normal situations, especially in a 60 million years old limestone from the Eocene era. Moreover, the nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy depicts similarities between a Cheops stone and a reconstituted stone. Additionally, in natural stones, we expect to find elements that had the time to crystallize. However, silicates in pyramid stones are completely amorphous, not crystallized. This allows us to think that we are in presence of a cementitious process. The silicates were formed in a very short period of time. Now, let's look at the geological evidence. In prehistoric times, most of present-day Egypt was submerged under the sea. The decomposing remains of marine organisms, shells and skeletons, plants, seaweed and algae, fallen to the bottom of the sea, formed mud that condensed itself into a sedimentary rock we call limestone, a natural process that lasted thousands of years, consolidated and hardened them, forming banks of limestone. The pyramid blocks are made of this limestone, a sedimentary rock formed from skeletons and large fossil shells of marine organisms. These fossil remains are normally found in sedimentary horizontal layers. Yet, in the stones of the Great Pyramid, Professor Davidovitz found them in disarray, jumbled up together quite haphazardly as if they were artificially mixed with some kind of pestle. Another phenomenon observed in the pyramid stones was the presence of air bubbles, organic fibers, bones, and animal teeth. Foreign materials never found in natural limestone, which would seem to be further proof that the stones were man-made. 
But there is an even more telling piece of evidence. One would expect that if the limestone from the pyramids were carved, they wouldn't easily disintegrate. And yet, this is exactly what happened in 1991 when Profron Davidovitz easily disaggregated Giza pyramid limestone in 24 hours. This, on the other hand, could not be achieved with natural limestone as it did not disintegrate at all. But there is written evidence, too, of how these stones were made. The Louvre Gallery in Paris is where the Irtisen Stele is preserved, room 7 of the thematic circuit. This ancient stone inscription does not go back quite as far as the era when the Great Pyramid was built, but it is very old, some 4,000 years old. It is the autobiographical funerary stele of Ertesen, a master craftsman of the priestly caste, who lived 2.000 years BC. In this text, Ertesen says he possesses a secret knowledge to fabricate stone statues, not by carving them, but by casting them in molds. Ertesen affirms he used a material mixture that hardened when cast inside molds to reproduce any kind of object or figure, a material that fire could not consume nor water dilute. This suggests that Erdison worked with a chemically produced binding matter that could be mixed with certain minerals and poured into a mold to produce statues. And if that technique could produce statues, it would have been a far easier process to produce limestone. Let's also remember that the Kometu had a scientific evolution process akin to the scientific method. Its only drawback is that it was secret and only shared with the initiates. Here we must emphasize a tendency by historians to dismiss some accounts because they do not understand the process or cannot verify it. Furthermore, the Sehel Stele also clearly speaks of a man-made fabricated material. This is important as it further validates the presence of geopolymer blocks even at this early period of Kemet. On Sahel Island, some kilometers downstream from the city of Aswan on the River Nile, an ancient rock can be seen. It is known as the Famine Stele, and its text appears in hieroglyphs occupying 32 columns that must be read from right to left. The first columns deal with the famine that occurred in the reign of the pharaoh Djoser, around 3.000 years BC, in a period earlier than the reign of Cheops. The engraved hieroglyphs tell the following story. For years, the Nile had periodically flooded its banks, watering the surrounding fields and making them apt for agriculture. In the reign of Djoser, however, the river did not rise, hence crops were unable to grow, the soil dried up and became sterile, and the result was a great famine throughout the land. The Steli text was originally deciphered in 1889, but due to the limitations of scientific knowledge of the time, that part containing the formula was misunderstood or not properly translated. Now, Professor Davidovitz, thanks to his chemical knowledge, has been able to decode its true meaning. Professor Davidovitz was particularly interested, however, not so much in the historical passages on the flood as in those which describe a chemical formula used in ancient times by a priest and sage, the great Imhotep, to fabricate an agglomerated block of stone. A section of the stele, known by scholars as the Revelations of Imhotep, contains significant words. One of them is Arikat, a composite of two hieroglyphs which form one single adjective. A-R-I is a verb meaning to work with, to fashion, or to form. It is symbolized by an eye, alongside a seated human figure which represents the man who does the work. The addition of cat, two hands held aloft and a semicircle, gives a new meaning, man-made, created by man. Ari cat, therefore, is something fashioned by man and, when associated with minerals, something processed or synthetically made. But Prof. Davidovitz is not the only one to have advanced this theory. Earlier experts have also suspected the geopolymer approach. 
The first man to posit a reasonable solution to how the Egyptians made their stone statues was Henri Le Chatelier, a chemist, ceramist, and metallurgist born in France in 1850. In the early 20th century, he noticed that the famous statue of Pharaoh Khafre, or Khephren, revealed no sign of tool marks. Yet it had been made of diorite, the hardest type of stone, at a time when artisans possessed only simple stone or copper chisels. He concluded that with tools like these, it would have been impossible to produce such a masterpiece. Admire here the statue of Pharaoh Khafre as his handsome figure is immortalized in this, the hardest of stones. Le Chatelier suspected that it had not been carved at all, but made of agglomerated stone cast in molds, so he began to examine other statues. He looked at ones that were apparently enameled and cut thin sections of them with a diamond-tipped saw and found that the enamel was not an applied coating, but part of the material from which the statue was made. He asserted that they were cast in some kind of synthetic material not sculpted in natural stone. The whole process would have looked like this. Workers would have prepared areas where crushed soft limestone, abundant in the Giza Plateau, would have been mixed with water and a binding agent to create the viscous paste. The paste would have been transported on sites using buckets, easily carried. Once on the pyramid site, they would have poured the paste into place and compacted it manually. After a few days of drying, the new stone bricks would now be perfectly in place. Notice that the problem of precision is resolved as the wooden casts allow for a guided process. Moreover, the crews can fine-tune the shape of each block once the paste is poured and compacted. Further corrections and smoothing can happen once the paste is half-dried. Much has been made about the fact that the pyramid is sitting on a very level base. With the geopolymer approach, leveling the base would have become a much easier feat, assisted by gravity forces on the still-liquid polymer. So how well does the geopolymer method fit our criteria? The geopolymer approach to pyramid building does not require any leap of faith as all the evidence is there. It is economically sensible and fits the archaeological finding pointing to a crew of 20,000 living in the pyramid building complex that has been discovered in recent years. In fact, using this approach, 20 years would have been plenty of time to build the pyramids. The drying of each layer of the pyramid would only take one or two days. With this approach, the working crew are allowed to perform their work without worrying about extreme precision. Each block will fit in place tightly next to the adjacent blocks. But more importantly, errors can easily be corrected. All the tools and elements needed to perform this technique were present in the time of the Third Dynasty pharaohs. What's more, it fits all the evidence discovered to date, from material and tools used to the written records left. The approach has been easily reproduced by Prof. Davidovitz and his team many times over. They were also able to reproduce the various textures of blocks seen in Giza. Lastly, it makes sense. Africans, in their building tradition, had been using composite material for building for a long time. The first ruler of the Nubio-Kemetic civilization complex, King Narmer, had his funerary complex built out of mud bricks. Although simpler in process, it is similar in approach. Incidentally, this technique is still being used all over Africa. Concrete building technique was also inherited by the Greeks in 600 BC before the Romans. To admit how the pyramids were really built would be to remove the possibility of the supernatural and assign this great deed to the people who lived there at the time, the Africans. And for many, this is too difficult to accept. Kemet also lasted so long that between their peak in the Old Kingdom, 2600 BC, to their renaissance in 1500 BC, many technologies had been lost and new building techniques were invented, old building secrets were forgotten or just fell out of style. What's more is that we find those building techniques from Kemet popping up in neighboring civilizations after they first appear in Egypt, namely the Greeks and the Romans.
From the great Master Diop himself, the line of ill-intentional Egyptologists, equipped with a ferocious erudition, have committed their well-known crime against science by becoming guilty of a deliberate falsification of the history of humanity, supported by the governing powers. If you like this content, drop us a comment. Above all, share it with everyone you think can benefit from it. We hear a lot about the negative voices, but it warms our hearts to hear your positive comments. Join us and see how those who are said to be without history birthed civilization itself. <laughs>